This is Nightly Business Report with Sue Herrera and Bill Griffin. Are you done? Is this it? Is this we're, the we're GE that I'm going to, yeah. you and I are going to be sitting here talking about two years yes. from now? Yes, it is. Absolutely. GE sheds more assets. The CEO says it's done slimming down and will focus the once sprawling conglomerate on just a few businesses. Crude realities. The State Department wants our allies to cut oil imports from Iran and oil prices rise. And Shelf Life, a startup devised a way to keep produce fresher longer, and it could save billions in food waste. Those stories and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Tuesday, June 26th. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Bill is off tonight. General Electric's extreme makeover is over. The industrial company is spinning off its health care business and shedding its ownership in the oil company Baker Hughes. The CEO says the move concludes a year-long strategic review that he hopes will get the one-time bellwether out of its rough patch. Investors seem to agree, at least for today, sending the stock up better than 7 percent, its best one-day gain in quite a while. Morgan Brennan has more on GE, the shrinking giant. A simpler, stronger GE. That's the vision unveiled by General Electric CEO and Chairman John Flannery today. We laid out a package of about $60 billion of potential value sources. 25 of that goes to the deleveraging of the company. That leaves an immense amount of surplus, if you will, uh, to deal with uh, leverage and risk uh, going forward. Or, you know, so I, I looked carefully at the balance sheet. It's clear we know how to get to the end point and how we're going to do it, and we have surplus. So, you know, I think when we spend some time with people, they'll see that. The plan established GE as a company focused solely on aviation power and renewable energy. That means spinning off GE's healthcare business as a standalone company, a process expected to take up to a year and a half to complete. It also means exiting its majority stake in Baker Hughes, which was merged with GE's oil and gas business last year. That, too, could take up to three years. Flannery believes the moves will unlock shareholder value and help shore up finances for a company that's seen its dividends slashed and its shares halved over the past year. I share in every sense the, the pain, if you will. I, you know, my, my life savings is in the stock, so I, I have the same sort of connection to the issue. The second thing I'd say is we've gone through a tough patch. We've faced into the issues. We're dealing with the issues. We have a plan. We know where we are. We're realistic about that. We know exactly where we want to go with the portfolio, with the balance sheet, with how we run the company. And we know exactly how to get there. And stay tuned for the ride here. The long-term strategy, which investors have been awaiting for months, sent GE storing, with the stock having its best day in nearly three years, even despite being booted from the Dow. Still, analysts say it's all going to take time. We've been short the stock for 18, 24 months, covered a little bit a couple months ago, and we're going to use this excuse to cover the rest of it. I think the story from here is very complicated, requires a lot of analysis, but at least they're taking the bull by the horns and trying to do something after, I would argue, years of deterioration. The devil will be in the details. GE is also cutting its corporate footprint and shifting more responsibilities back to the businesses themselves. A move expected to shave off at least $500 million in costs and, though Flannery did not elaborate, likely result in more layoffs. Also in focus, the dividend, which GE said it would maintain today until GE Healthcare, the company, is established. At that time, the board will adjust the payout to be in line with industrial peers, meaning it is likely to go lower. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Morgan Brennan at the New York Stock Exchange. So is the worst over for the stock? It is the question that many longtime shareholders certainly want answered. With us now to talk about that is Scott Davis, CEO of the research firm Melius Research. Good to see you, Scott. Welcome. Thanks, Sue. Happy to be here. You have been calling and your firm has been calling for a full breakup of GE yeah. for some time now. Um, is this good enough? I think it's what we're going to get. I think it's as, as, I mean, I think it's as best as we could have really expected, given that a full breakup would have included the power business, which I just don't think could stand alone right now. It's not strong enough. But you've got a great aerospace business that's left. You've got a great healthcare business. Uh, this is a. It's going to be a good show. Um, Mr. Flannery said, ultimately, our mission is better return, less cost, less bureaucracy, and that we're going to see a dramatic change. Does yeah. this plan, do you think, achieve less bureaucracy and better return? 
Yes, I mean the answer is yes, but you, you didn't have a choice. I mean the company was so big that how do you how do you take costs out and bureaucracy out of something that that Byzantine? It was just so broad, and I think this gets it down to something manageable, mm -hmm. um, where you can you can identify compensation for you know for each of the the, the CEOs now that that you know is directly tied to the business itself. Whereas before you could you could be running the aerospace business and do a wonderful job, but if somebody messes up in power, then you you know you don't get paid for it. And, right. and morale is terrible for that. You have a buy or accumulate on the stock. You were out early with <laughs> with a stock price of I think the mid twenties. Yeah. Now you say twenty seven, uh, but that's a longer term price target. Yeah, right? it's two it's two years. And, and and we do think it can get there. I mean I know it sounds crazy from fourteen dollars to to uh, you know, 27, 28, but you can get there in two years. I mean, gosh, I mean, two years ago it was up, it was at 28 dollars or so. So that's right. Uh, you know, it fell, but it can go back. What about you know Morgan's last comment about the dividend? Uh, Mr. Flannery said today on CNBC that they want to maintain the dividend, given yeah. what you know and you follow this company so closely. Um, that may be his best of intention, but a lot of our viewers bought the stock for the dividend. Yeah. Do you think it's safe? Um, the answer is yes, but you have to you have to understand that when you spin off healthcare, healthcare will have its own dividend policy, and healthcare is a growthier asset, so it's more likely to have a lower payout ratio. Mm -hmm. um, but the other businesses should be growing cash flow over the next couple of years and into that spin off. So the odds of, of of maintaining most of that dividend is pretty high. I mean, could it be a couple pennies below or, or lower? Yes, it could be, but I don't think it's going to be material. All right, Scott, thank you so much. Thank As you. always, Scott Davis of Melius Research. Morgan, of course, just a moment ago mentioned GE's exit from the Dow, which became official today. After more than a century as part of the blue chip index, it's being replaced by Walgreens. Walgreens fell 1% in its Dow debut today. On Wall Street overall, stocks bounced back after yesterday's steep sell off. Tech stocks rebounded, but confusion over trade policy capped some of the gains. The Dow Jones Industrial Average rose 30 points to 24,283. The Nasdaq added 29, and the S&P 500 was up about six. In Washington, President Trump took aim at Harley Davidson. As we reported, the iconic American company announced yesterday that it was going to move some factory production out of the U.S., citing tariffs. The president threatened to tax the company, quote, like never before, end quote. Harley Davidson is using that as an excuse, and I don't like that because I've been very good to Harley Davidson, and they used it as an excuse. And I think the people that ride Harleys are not happy with Harley Davidson, and I wouldn't be either. Uh, but mostly companies are coming back. Shares of Harley-Davidson finished the day slightly lower. An automotive trade group plans to tell the White House that a 25 percent tariff on imported passenger vehicles would cost consumers $45 billion annually. The Alliance of Automobile Manufacturers says the tariff would cancel out the benefits of the tax cuts. A new report from the Congressional Budget Office says rising interest rates will pressure government finances. That could push interest payments to record levels in the coming decades. Currently, debt payments are 1.6 percent of gross domestic product, but that could rise to more than 6 percent by the year 2048. And at that point, interest payments would equal spending on Social Security. Well, the State Department threw the energy market for a loop today. The Trump administration is pressing allies to end all imports of Iranian oil by November or risk sanctions. The administration's hardline approach sent the price of domestic crude above $70 a barrel. John Kilduff of Again Capital is with us now to discuss how all of this might play out. Good to see you as always, John. Good evening. Uh, to say it threw the energy market for a loop was it perhaps maybe downplaying a little bit. No one really saw this hardline approach coming. No, historically, whenever sanctions were imposed on a country, be it Iran or Iraq or others, uh, these are usually implemented in stages uh, to give the, the tariffed country the opportunity to correct its behavior and potentially, you know, return to the market. Uh, we've known that the uh, Trump administration has been very forward-leaning against Iran by pulling out of the nuclear deal. And this, though, to, to, to sever Iran's ability to sell oil to the, into the global market on November 4th, full stop, was uh, a bold move that uh, really was a broadside to the market today. What do you think the motivation is for that? And what, what has been the response from some of our uh, Middle Eastern partners, such as Saudi Arabia? Well, Iran is teetering. 
Uh, their currency has collapsed. There have been rare protests in the streets the past several days because of the inflation that that, uh, that currency collapse has wrought. Mm -hmm. You have to believe that the administration feels that by implementing this, by cutting off really their economic lifeline, that they could tip over the regime potentially and get regime change in Iran. It's something that would be very welcomed by others in the Middle East, like Saudi Arabia, who see Iran as interfering in, in Middle East politics and in, in, in countries like Syria and Yemen. Uh, they have become almost a mortal enemy. Saudi Arabia and Iran, remarkably so. So the Saudis have now stepped up today and told us that they're going to be putting 11 million barrels a day of oil on the market starting next month, starting July 1st, uh, to, to help offset uh, the pain and problems that this Iran's severing is going to cause. Now, what does this do near term for the price of oil? Because obviously now there are a lot more moving parts than there were just 24 hours ago. We moved above $70 a barrel. Is there more upside to oil prices? There, there, there's more upside. Uh, the market was already tight uh, going into the recent OPEC meeting. That's why you had a response from OPEC members over the weekend to increase oil production. Uh, this only adds to it because there's a deficit. We're consuming more oil right now than is being produced, than is being put out in the market. Mm -hmm. Because countries like Venezuela, for example, at a 50-year production low. Uh, the troubles that we've seen over the years in Libya keep revisiting themselves. Uh, Nigeria, as well, is only a, a pipeline bomb away from oil off the market. So. We are within the five-year average of oil inventories. They're only coming down, and we are now set up uh, to really spike higher if we lose even another barrel. Very quickly, if we, indeed we see these higher prices, how inflationary is it for the overall economy? Well, it's, it's quite inflationary uh, because it rips through uh, to the food sector first because mm -hmm. they're constantly delivering things. But it'll affect uh, pricing uh, really across uh, merchandising uh, for consumer goods, Cruise lines, obviously the gasoline pump will be right back to 4 and $5 a gallon, unfortunately. Consumer sentiment takes a big hit when that happens. We saw the conference board number tick down today. That was from last month's trip to $3 a All gallon. Right. John, we will be watching. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. John Kilduff of Again Capital. And from oil to natural gas, the U.S. is producing a lot of it, and that is changing the dynamics of a key part of the energy industry. Brian Sullivan is at the World Gas Conference in Washington. Oil may get the headlines, but natural gas is shaking up the geopolitical energy game even more than its crude cousin. In just the last few years, the United States has become a gas powerhouse. So for the first time in more than 30 years, the World Gas Conference is taking place in America. Energy Secretary Rick Perry spoke at the event and highlighted America's gas boom. We will set a record this year for dry natural gas production with an average of 81.2 billion cubic feet per day and we'll break that record next year. We're now producing so much gas that America is now a net exporter for the first time ever and the International Energy Agency believes that liquefied natural gas from the U.S. will surge from just 4 percent global market share now to more than 20 percent in just five years. In the next five years about 45 percent almost half of the global gas production growth comes from the United States. That's good news for companies like Chenier Energy and Dominion Resources, which export American liquefied natural gas around the world. But it could also put us on a collision course with Russia, which is building a new $12 billion pipeline to double natural gas capacity to Europe. That may explain why Russia's energy minister is at the Washington conference and is expected to meet with Secretary Perry. Both the United States and Russia see mainland Europe and Asia as big markets for their same product. So the two old adversaries are going to have to learn to play nicely in the same global gas sandbox or risk sparking yet another fight on the trade front, this time over natural gas. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Brian Sullivan, Washington, D.C. It is time to take a look at some of today's upgrades and downgrades. Intel's rating was cut again, this time by Bernstein, which now rates the stock and underperform. The analysts cite structural issues at the company. The price target is 42. The stock fell 2 percent to 49.67. Sirius XM was downgraded to underweight from equal weight at Barclays. The analyst says the company is entering a more mature phase of growth, which presents a new set of challenges. The price target is $5. The stock fell about 2 percent to 6.92. 
And TJX Companies was downgraded to neutral from overweight at Atlantic Equities. The analyst cites valuation given the stock's 24 percent gain so far this year. The price target is $90 and the stock fell slightly to $95. 17. Still ahead, why renovating your home could cost you a lot. Strong housing demand and an expanding economy helped the nation's largest home builder, Lennar, easily beat estimates last quarter. While both earnings and revenue grew strongly, the company also said average sales prices of their homes jumped more than 10 percent to $418,000. The shares rose nearly 5 percent on the day, and that in turn helped lift the rest of the home builders in today's session. Home price gains surged in April but slowed ever so slightly from the previous month, a possible sign that higher mortgage rates may have been a factor for buyers. The S&P Case-Shiller National Home Price Index rose 6.4 percent in April year over year. That was down a tick from March. The national number tracks average prices from metro areas all around the country. And in today's pricey and competitive housing market, it is no surprise home remodeling is soaring as more homeowners choose to stay put. But some of the same factors making home buying so expensive are also making home remodeling more expensive. Diana Olek has more. With fewer of these around, there's more of this going on. If you can't find a better bathroom, rebuild your own. More and more homeowners are doing just that. People get frustrated looking for a house in the right neighborhood at the right price point, and it does generally make more sense to just customize your own home. And while kitchens and bathrooms are always most popular, the master bedroom suite has moved up to number three in most popular remodels, according to a new survey from Howes, a remodeling website. Today, master bathrooms are the third most popular room to renovate, and the spend on master bedrooms has increased 33 percent, and that's pretty consistent with the online activity of over 40 million unique monthly users on house. Likely because today's homeowners are increasingly focused on resale value. You will get more bang for the buck and a better return when you go to sell to have that full master suite. But getting the best bang for your renovation buck is getting harder because it's harder to find contractors to do the work. The same labor shortage that's keeping more new homes from being built is putting renovation projects on hold. Homeowners are looking at much longer duration for both of the start time and the completion of the project. That combined with the rising costs of labor and more recently product product and materials, we are looking at, at rising prices for home renovation services. And there's also LED lights going But through. for now, at least, homeowners are choosing patience over paying even higher prices to move. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Diana Olick in Washington. ConAgra may gobble up Pinnacle Foods, and that's where we begin tonight's market focus. CNBC says ConAgra Brands is in advanced talks to acquire the owner of the Bird's Eye label a deal that would create the nation's second largest frozen food company, trailing only Nestle, and it would have a combined market value of more than $23 billion. There has been speculation about a merger between the two for several months now. Shares of Pinnacle rose more than 2 percent to 67.86, while ConAgra was off nearly 2 percent to 38.23. The metal recycler Schnitzer Steel beat estimates with revenue rising 36 percent. Adjusted earnings beat by eight cents. But the company issued a fourth quarter outlook that was, for the most part, below consensus. And that disappointed investors. The shares fell 3 percent to 33.65, but they are up about 60 percent over the past 12 months. And Rite Aid sent a letter to shareholders detailing the merits of its proposed $24 billion merger with the grocery chain Albertsons, ahead of a stockholder vote on August 9th. The companies filed their proxy today, setting the vote process into motion. The merger is facing opposition by some shareholders that are holding out for a better offer and others who just want to kill the deal. Rite Aid shares fell 7 percent to $1.96. 
You know, it is still tough to be a woman on Wall Street, but men apparently don't always notice. That is the finding of the first ever joint gender gap survey by CNBC and LinkedIn. Julia Borston joins us to discuss the results. Julia, it's good to see uh, see you here in New York. Uh, we hear a lot about the gender gap on Wall Street. So basically, what were some of the details of the survey? Is it as dramatic as some people perceive it to be? Well, you know, there are a lot of rumors about people saying that women have a hard time breaking the glass ceiling. Um, but one thing we really found is that women see a lot of bias that men oftentimes don't see. And of course, there's a lot of talk about equal pay. And one thing that's really interesting is only 40 percent of women think they believe that men and women are paid equally, whereas 75 percent of men see say they think that men and women are paid equally at their companies. So big discrepancy in how, how people perceive just that issue of pay. Now, the promotion issue has also been historically a, a big one on Wall Street. What did the survey tell us about whether or not men and women in finance see this issue the same way? So we asked the question of whether men and women, we asked both of them, whether they think that men and women are promoted at an equal rate. Less than half of women think that men and women wow. with the same experience are promoted in equal weight, but weight rate, but again, about three quarters of men say they see relatively equal promotion. So it's interesting that about a quarter of men don't see equal promotion. So even men mm -hmm. see a promotion gap there the same way that roughly the same percentage of men saw a pay gap there, but women see a much bigger gap in both pay and promotion than men do. That's a surprising finding to me, but you've gone through all the details of this survey. What was the biggest surprise to you or what stood out? You know, the thing that really struck me is we talk a lot about whether women are opting out, if they're taking themselves out of the game because they're not a fan of the culture or whatever it is. And it turns out that almost no one said that the reason we aren't seeing women advance to senior levels is because they are opting out of that process. So obviously we are pulling people who are still in, in the process, who are still working on Wall Street, and so there might be some bias there. But the people who are on Wall Street see no reason that, that you can attribute the fact that women are opting out for the reason they're not advancing. And the good news is that there are a lot of easy w solutions to this problem, mm -hmm. good ways to close the gap, such as changing corporate culture and little things like making work-life balance a little bit more flexible, allowing people to work from home different hours. I know that's big for both men and women. Absolutely. Julia, great to see you. Great to be here, Sue. Julia Borston for us tonight. Coming up, switching gears, an avocado that stays ripe longer and the science behind it could fight food waste. Here's a look at what to watch for tomorrow. We get a look at durable goods orders in May, and Wall Street focuses on this number since it is generally a leading indicator of industrial production and spending. And with all of the talk of trade, tomorrow's May trade deficit number will be of interest, of course. And with oil breaking 70 today, the markets will likely focus on the weekly inventory report. And that is some of what to watch for tomorrow. J.M. Smucker is looking to innovate. The food company is partnering with Rev1 Ventures. It invests in startups, and the move will help Smucker find startups that can help out in areas like process and supply chain technology. And one star uh, startup is hoping to tackle a big problem for retailers. It is food waste. Food waste costs U.S. companies nearly $20 billion a year. And as Aditi Roy tells us, this startup is trying to help out by upending produce and is teaming up with a big retailer. She's in Goleta, California for us tonight. The 100 people who work in this sprawling corporate office building near Santa Barbara, California, are literally giving new life to produce. They work for Appeal Sciences, a startup that produces a plant-based coating for produce that the company says extends the shelf life of fruits and veggies by weeks and sometimes even doubles it. These lemons are now four months old. Uh, these are untreated lemons and then these are treated lemons. James Rogers founded Appeal when he was still a PhD student in material science at UC Santa Barbara. Back then, he knew a lot about polymer physics, but little about produce. I called my mom to tell her about this idea. She said, that sounds really nice, sweetie, but you don't know anything about fruits and vegetables. But Rogers went ahead with his idea anyway, and it proved 
fruitful. Today, appeal is backed by some of tech's top investors, including the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And now, appeal-coated avocados will be in select Costco stores across the country. Tastes the same? That's right. As a regular avocado? That's right. It's an avocado. Rogers says retailers who use the product can dramatically reduce supply chain costs by reducing food waste, which one study says costs U.S. retailers $18 billion a year. At the store level, this is one of the biggest challenges that most retailers face is the amount of shrink that they see on their shelves. The coating is made of the peel of fruits and vegetables. It starts out as a powder, but then mixes with water to become a solution into which produce is dipped. Rogers says the coating strengthens the existing peel of the produce, which helps it last longer in your refrigerator. We're slowing down the rate the clock is ticking. But there are obstacles. While the FDA says appeals invisible and tasteless coating is generally recognized as safe, we talked to some customers skeptical of biting into a piece of fruit dipped into a solution, natural or not. Well, I would prefer to pick up my apple from the tree. Rogers answers those critics by urging them to take a bite for themselves before making a decision. We're not thinking about this as only being a solution in one small area of the world. Um, we're thinking really big and uh, other folks are with us. The company says appeal coated avocados will sell at the same price at Costco as regular avocados because the retailer will be picking up the cost of the product. Why? Appeal says by reducing food waste costs, the companies they're working with will still come out ahead. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Aditi Roy, Golita, California. And before we go, let's take a look at the, fin the final numbers on Wall Street for you. The Dow had an upside day. It rose 30 points. The Nasdaq added 29, and the S&P 500 was up about 6. And that will do it for Nightly Business Report tonight. I'm Sue Herrera. Thanks for joining us. Have a great evening, and we'll see you tomorrow.